Good morning. I'll give you just a minute to um, find Matthew 27 in your Bible. I think you'd want to follow along. We're going to read through it a couple times throughout the sermon today. Uh, so while you're looking for that, uh, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I talked to Ruben about a month ago about coming back to preach this morning. And, um, you know, a funny thing happened. I, I print out my notes the night before I preach typically so I can review them one last time. And this time when I printed them out, uh, only half printed out. And there wasn't an error. I didn't run out of paper. It just only half printed out. Uh, so the good news is I figured that out because I'm reviewing my notes and there was no ending, but I thought about it. What if I had the confidence to not review my notes and I just showed up with half a sermon? That would have been, <laughs> I mean, we'd be the first people at Friendly's today, but um, man, that kept me up. That kept me up worrying. I, it could have been worse. I, a few years ago, there was a medical convention that I attended in Boston for work and there was an evening session, and um, I was in a hotel, so I went to get my colleague uh, down the hallway so that he and I could grab a cab and run over to the evening session together. And so he was in a rush, uh, so he, he said, I gotta grab my allergy pill. So he takes his pill, grabs a drink of water, and we run outside and get a cab. And on the way to the convention center in Boston, he reaches into his pocket and pulls out another pill. And he goes, uh-oh. And I said, what's wrong? And he goes, this is my allergy pill. I said, well, what did you take at the hotel? My sleeping pill. So <laughs> I did not take a sleeping pill today. I took two ibuprofen. I feel very confident that we're going to get through it. So, um, but we're going to read from Matthew 27 uh, again, verses 45 through 54. I'm going to read it, and then we'll pray and get into the sermon. Now, from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. That is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were also opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. And when the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the son of God. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we come to you today. We are grateful, Lord. For your scripture. We're grateful for Matthew's account of the crucifixion. We're thankful, Lord, um, that these actions that you took, these moments at the end of your life here on earth, were recorded for our learning and for our benefit, Father. We pray this morning that your Holy Spirit would touch our hearts, would touch the preaching of your word, and bring something fresh and new for all of us, Lord, that you have to say to us, that you have for us to see. And I pray all this in Jesus' heavenly name. Amen. So um, typically when I have a chance to, to preach, I don't choose a subject that I want to preach on and then begin, begin to build a sermon around it. Um, my process is, is often just to pray initially. Just pray for the Lord's leading and ask him to show me what, what the word is. And often it's a learning that I need, and then it becomes a sermon. So it begins in prayer. Um, if it was the other way around, if I was just picking a, a topic, I never would have chosen anything regarding the crucifixion. 
just because of the heaviness of this topic and the solemn nature of it. But as I prayed about this leading up to the Easter holiday, this is what was heavy on my heart, the, these moments from the crucifixion. And so I read all the gospel accounts of the crucifixion. Each, each of the four gospels capture this in some unique way. And we'll look at Matthew's, just these couple verses today that only Matthew records. But after reading through the gospel accounts, I go into commentaries, um, I do research on other respected uh, preachers and theologians and how they work through these verses, and I really study all that to, to place it into a sermon. W one of the ideas that I love is, is from a pastor named J.D. Greer that Emily and I often listen to, and he talks about what an advantage the disciples had to learn because they walked with Jesus. He, he says, imagine you were one of the disciples and there's this theological issue that you're having a disagreement about. One side sees it one way, one side sees it the other. And they're at small group and they could say to Jesus, explain this to us. And he could, he could make it all clear, right? They could say, Jesus, there's someone in our midst who's sick. And because they walked with Jesus and he was right there, he could heal that person. They could say, Jesus, my dog died this week and Jesus would bring the dog back to life. And someone would say, my cat died this week and Jesus is right by your side helping you dig a hole for him. It's a joke. <laughs> Not a cat person. I just say that I do approach this topic with... Um, respect and fear and trepidation, um, thinking about the crucifixion and praying through it and just asking that we all read through these scriptures today and look for what the Lord wants to show you about this because there's a couple verses in here and my sermon is, is titled today, Where Death Has No Power. And I know death is a topic that is very challenging for us to work through and to deal with. And the death of Christ is a huge topic for the Christian. And although last week was Easter and we celebrate his resurrection, there is so much to celebrate in these verses about the death of Christ, and we'll see that. So we're going to pick it up again in Matthew 27, verse 45, and we'll just go verse by verse through this, and I'll call out some things to your attention. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. So in the Gospel of Mark, which, which we're not in, uh, it indicates that the crucifixion began at the third hour. Okay, so that's nine at the, in the morning. Matthew picks up here at the sixth hour, so it's noon. And for the next three hours till 3 p.m., darkness comes over the entire land. And then in verse 46, it says... And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. That is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, there's harmony among the gospels. And what that means is, if you read all four gospel accounts, they capture the crucifixion differently, but cohesively. So having read through all of them, you can see a full picture of the crucifixion. And one of the things that they agree upon, are there are seven times that Jesus cries out from the cross. Seven times. This is the fourth. This is the fourth time that Jesus speaks from the cross and he cries out, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. In verse 47, some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is called Elijah. This man is calling Elijah. They were wrong. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. So they hear him calling out. They think he's calling to Elijah for him to save him, to get, take him off the cross. What they missed is that this is the cry of the psalmist in Psalm 22 
We won't read it today. It's a short chapter, but it's your homework this week. Read Psalm 22. It's the Psalm of David, and it begins with this verse. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And here is Christ on the cross crying that out. And in verse 50, it says, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. So there's a couple things in this that we have to unpack. So the first is, it says, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice. If you've ever been with someone in their final moments, if you've ever held a hand or been in the room with someone who passed away, one thing you know is there is not a loud voice. They leave this earth quietly, almost hard to speak or in an inaudible whisper, but not Christ. His declaration from the cross is a loud voice. He is strong till the moment of his death. And why is that different? Why does that matter? It's because of the second part of that verse. And he yielded up his spirit. This is something dramatically different than your life being taken from you. Christ yielded up his spirit. This is a voluntary act. Something was not taken from him, he gave something. We often talk about Christ's time on earth as a sacrifice. He left heaven, came to earth as a man, and sacrificed his life for us. And we, we think of the act that he was willing to die as a sacrifice. It would be unusual for one of us to be willing to die for someone else. That would be considered a sacrifice. But there was something different that Christ did. When it came time to die, death did not come on him in a way he couldn't control. He had to yield up his spirit. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when the soldiers come to take him away, he says, I could call on my father and he would send 12 legions of angels. In other words, if I don't want to die, I don't have to. But he chooses to. He gives up his life. It's an act that he does. And this isn't me taking a few words and thinking there's a new avenue to go down and, we can, and, and there's a sermon in this. This is all throughout scripture. And I'm gonna show you that in John chapter 10, Verse 11, verse 15, verse 17, and 18. Listen to this. In 11, he says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Again, laying down your life is a voluntary act. Do you remember when David went to fight Goliath? There was a moment before he fought Goliath where he had to give his resume, so to speak, to Saul to be taken seriously. He said, as a shepherd... I, uh, a bear and a lion came and carried off a sheep, and I went after it and brought the sheep back. Christ is using that type of imagery. He says, I am the good shepherd. But he didn't just fight a bear. He didn't just fight a lion for us. He lays down his life voluntarily as the shepherd protecting his sheep. In verse 15, it says again, just as the father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And then in 17 and 18, if we needed any clarity, it says this. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. He had been beaten mercilessly. He had been whipped. He had been forced to carry his cross through the streets. He hung on a cross from the third hour to the ninth hour. He had nails through hands and feet and thorns on head. But it says right here, no one takes my life from me. But I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This is the charge I received from my father. And this is the hope of the Christian. That Christ died as a voluntary act. 
He had authority to die, and he did. And he had authority to be resurrected, and he did. So this voice, this voice that we hear crying out from the cross, death bows before the authority of this voice. This is the same voice that in John eleven forty three cried out for Lazarus to come forth. And Lazarus, who had been dead four days at that point, walks out of the tomb alive. The voice of Christ, death cannot refuse. This brings us to the first point of the sermon where, again, where death has no power is, is the title here. In verse 51, we see that death has no power to separate us from Christ. So in verse 51, it says, Behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So what is the curtain? The curtain, or often referred to as the veil, was hung in the tabernacle when the Israelites were traveling through the desert. And then in Jerusalem, when they built the temple, it hung in the temple. The curtain created an act of separation. So within the tabernacle or the temple, there was an inner place where the priests could serve daily. And that was called the holy place. And then there was an, an even smaller inner sanctum called the most holy place. In this area, there was some artifacts of the time where the Israelites wandered through the desert. And within that was the Ark of the Covenant, and on top of that, two cherubim with their wings facing each other. The whole thing was covered in gold, and the presence of God rested between the two angels. And this area, called the Most Holy Place, was only visited once a year by, by the high priest, chosen by Lot to go in there and serve a sacrifice for the atonement of his sins and the sins of his people. And it was separated by this curtain. This curtain meant separation from the priest and for all of us from the presence of God. So in verse 51, it says, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The curtain had significance and the significance where you and I were separated from God. His presence was mediated to us at that time through a priest. Hebrews 9, verses 2 through 5 tell us, A tent was prepared, the first section in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. It is called the holy place. Behind the curtain, or the veil, was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna, and Aaron's staff that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it was the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Now the Jewish Talmud and the Mishnah hold that this veil was 60 feet long from top to bottom. So when they hung it, it hung 60 feet high. It was also 30 feet wide. And there's Jewish writings saying that it was uh, woven into a single piece, a single item, and it was as thick or as deep as the breadth of a man's hand from the tip of the pinky to the thumb. So we're talking eight or nine inches deep, 60 feet high, 30 feet wide, and this hung in the temple. This was the separation Jewish writing also says that it took 300 able-bodied priests to move it because of the weight of it. 300 able-bodied priests were necessary to move this. So we learn now what, uh, how this veil separates. And in Leviticus 16, we hear for the first time, the Lord tells Moses how Aaron, the high priest at the time, is to enter this most holy place. And it says this, Aaron is to kill a bull, sprinkle the blood of the bull on the mercy seat to make atonement for the sins of himself and his family. So the first thing that happens once a year, the high priest enters this most holy place. 
and he brings the blood of a bull that he's killed, and he sprinkles it on the ark. And the reason is, before he can atone for the sins of the people, he first has to ask for forgiveness of his own sins and that of his family. The high priest at that time also wore some form of bells that were woven into his, um, in, into his garment, and he had uh, a rope tied around his waist or his leg. And the reason was, if the priests who were outside the most holy place stopped hearing those bells, it meant the high priest had died, that maybe he had done something in his interface with God that had led to his death. And because they couldn't enter, they would use the rope to pull him out. So that's the seriousness with which they approached this time in the most holy place. And then what would happen is the high priest would bring two goats and he would kill the first goat. This goat is referred to as the blood goat. And this blood would be sprinkled again on the ark on the mercy seat to atone for the sins of the people. There always had to be a blood sacrifice. So the priest would do this with the first goat. And then with the second goat, he would place his hands on the goat and he would pray over the goat. And he would ask for the forgiveness of sins for the Jewish people. And then the goat would be brought outside the temple, outside the city and released into the wilderness, never to be seen again. And it was symbolic of Christ forgiving our sins and separating them from us. So this is what took, took place at the time. But the problem is animal sacrifice is not a perfect sacrifice. It was repeated over and over and over again to atone for sin. Animal substitution can never fully atone for the sins of the people. It says in Hebrews chapter 10, Every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. We see this imagery when John the Baptist is in the wilderness and he sees Christ coming towards him and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God. This is what people understood, that there was a lamb that had to be sacrificed. There was an animal sacrifice. John the Baptist is saying, Christ is that sacrifice, but he's the perfect sacrifice that takes away the sin of the world. And in Romans 5, 8, and 9, it says, God shows his love for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore, we've been justified by his blood much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. So in this verse, we learn that the veil tore from top to bottom. That is a really specific detail, and it has a lot of importance because this was miraculous, what happened. Not only because it took 300 men to hang this, this curtain, but it tore from the top to the bottom specifically so that man could not take credit for it. No man could come in and say, well, his disciples deceived us. They took it and they ripped it. They'd have to be at the bottom. This tore from the top where only God could tear it. Gary Hamrick um, says this, the tearing of the veil abolished the intercessory role of the priesthood. So once and for all, the priesthood is no longer necessary because the veil tore, this separation ended. No longer does man need to go through another man to get to God. John 14, 6, Jesus says this during his ministry. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is our mediator, our mediator and our great high priest, and death has no power to separate us from Christ. Finally, Romans 8, 37 through 39 says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, 
angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Satan uses death to separate. But where death was meant to cause separation, it was the death of Christ that tore the veil and gave us access to God. We come to the second point, death has no power over God's creation. And this is what it says. The earth shook and the rocks were split. So at the moment Christ yields up his spirit, the earth shook, rocks split. Just a few days before the crucifixion, in Luke 19, it captures the details of the triumphal entry, right? Christ rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. The word of his ministry, his miracles, healings, all precede him. And there's crowds. They gather to praise him, to glorify him. And this is met with some resistance by the Jewish leaders of the day. We see this in Luke 19, verses 37 through 40. As he's drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples begin to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. The presence of Christ among his creation demands glory. John Piper says that the purpose of our very existence is to bring glory to the name of God. Anytime as a Christian, if you ever wonder what your purpose is, if you ever doubt the value and the purpose of your life. We are created primarily to bring glory to God. To be a Christian, to be a Christ one, to be an image bearer of Christ, it tells us during creation, we are created in his image. We're meant to bring glory to God. That's our calling here on earth. Here in Matthew, we see the earth erupting. It's crumbling as Christ gives up his spirit and passes from life to death, this is an earthquake. This is a natural phenomenon, but it took place when Christ yields up his spirit. It's really interesting because we hear of earthquakes and, and, it, and it's negative, it's terrible. There's a loss of life, there's destruction. But this was not a negative thing at this time. This is the creation of God, recognizing the body of Christ transferring from the physical world into the spiritual world. And it shakes at his presence. There are many instances within the Bible where the created world bows to the wishes of Christ. Do you remember in Matthew chapter eight, Jesus is asleep in the boat with his disciples and there's a storm raging around him but he continues to sleep. And why does he sleep? Because he has confidence that something they perceive as a danger answers to him. We don't get concerned when something that answers to us starts to go wrong because we have power over it. The disciples were terrified because they had no power over the wind and the waves. So they say to him, Master, how can you sleep at a time like this? And Jesus says, oh, you of little faith. And then he speaks to the wind and the waves, and they calm down. And you know what the disciples say? What sort of man is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. You know what? The centurion answers their question. When the disciples say, what sort of man is this? The centurion at the end of the crucifixion, he answered the question. He says, surely this man is the son of God. He recognized it. They were in the boat with him. 
The centurion saw it on the cross. I think the centurion saw the earth shake. He saw the lights go out for three hours. He had crucified other criminals in his day. This is not what happens when you crucify a criminal. The lights don't go out for three hours. The earth doesn't shake and rocks split. That's what happens when you crucify the Son of God. One source that I read from says, at Calvary, the very stones are crying out, testifying to the significance of the death that has taken place and the work that has been completed. If the created and the natural world bears testimony to the terrible majesty of God and the authority of Jesus Christ and to the redemptive significance of the cross, it is little wonder that Paul declares that the things that are made leave us without excuse. This is the evidence that death has no power over God's created world. Because on this day, when the crowds demanded the release of Barabbas and they cried out for Christ to be crucified, on this day when Peter denies Jesus three times and disciples scatter, on this day when silence and darkness enveloped the earth and human voice failed to bring glory to God, on this day, at the moment of Christ's death, in the absence of praise, the rocks cry out. And then we come to the third point, death has no power over the believer. In verse 52 and 53, we see this, the tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Think about this. So we just learned there was an earthquake and the rocks split. At this time, this is where people were buried. If there was some money or standing in the community and you could afford to do this, there were hillsides with rock and a sepulcher or a tomb was carved out and bodies were placed in there. So as the earth shakes and rocks split, the dead in Christ begin to raise. They come back to life. This is only captured right here in Matthew's gospel. It says the tombs were also opened. Many bodies of the saints, those who had died in Christ, had fall, who had fallen asleep, that means death, were raised. And coming out of their tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So it's really interesting. The rock split, the dead in Christ are raised up, but it says they come out of the tomb after his resurrection. So Christ is in the tomb three days. The saints are awake at the moment he dies, but they stay in there because the first resurrection we see is Christ. Christ is the first fruit. And this small gathering, we don't know how many there were, but they went into Jerusalem and they appeared to many. This is just a small taste of the resurrection for believers when Christ returns and takes us to, to heaven. And here we see it played out at the moment of his death. Satan uses death as a weapon. For the unbeliever, death is the loss of opportunity to place their faith in Christ and live with, for the, for the unbeliever, it is the loss of opportunity to place their faith in Christ and to live with him for eternity. But for the believer, death is just the start. So we come to ask, what is the significance of this occurrence? It was a sign that Christ was engaging himself successfully, victoriously in the abolition of death and the destruction of the last enemy. It is symbolized in a marvelous way, the death of death itself. The opening of the graves together with the resurrection of many of the saints to sleep in them signified first the destruction of Satan. Hebrews chapter two, verse 14 is explicit on this theme of the victory of Christ when it declares that Christ became a partaker of flesh and blood that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil himself. The last enemy is now not only disarmed, he is also finally defeated, slain 
like Goliath of old with his own sword. I love that sentence. In other words, the same way that David killed the giant with his own sword, the death of Christ kills Satan's reign over death. Death can't separate anymore because Christ yields up his spirit and does it voluntarily. That is why graves open when the Son of God gives up the ghost. He is bringing captive captivity, and at last all that is satanic and deathly is bound by the king priest of the cross. Death, death has no power over the believer. So finally, we come to the end, verse 54, and this is where we see the centurion, and this is our call to action as a believer. In verse 54, it says, when the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe, and they said, truly, this was the Son of God. And that's our call. Christ brings salvation to those who do what the centurion just did. Recognize that this was the Son of God and place your faith in him. The centurion sees this all happen and he cries out, truly this man was the Son of God. In 1 Peter 3, verse 18, it says, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. This is the call of salvation in two sentences. He suffers once for our sins. That's all it took, one perfect death, and Christ did it. The righteous for the unrighteous, meaning he was righteous, none of us were, so he died for us, that he might what? Bring us to God. That's his intention. His death was meant to bring us to God. Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. I'll close with this. Um, in the final year of my grandfather's life, he was in a nursing home and uh, a few days or maybe a week or so before he passed away, he had a chance to speak with my father alone. My father's a minister and was there, you know, just spending time with him. And he said to my father, and this is a man who's followed Christ all his life, but in these final days before death, he's questioning and he says to my dad, how do I know that I did enough? How do I know that I'm going to be with God? And my dad said, the good news is, Bob, it's never going to be about what you did. It's always about the confidence we have in what he did. And so I'll finish with Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 and 20. It says, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. Remember, we talked about the holy place. Now we enter it without a priest, without a veil, between us, we enter it because of the blood of Jesus by the new and living way that he opened it for us through the curtain. That is through his flesh. There's no ambiguity here. He says, instead of the curtain, it's through my flesh. The curtain tore, Christ's flesh had to be torn to, to break that separation. And in verse 21, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our body washed with pure water. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> thank you so much, Lord, for the sacrifice you made sending your son Thank you, Jesus, for the sacrifice you made, living among us and choosing to die. You had every opportunity, you had all the power to avoid it. 
But you went through with it and you took it. The righteous for the unrighteous. And we have hope today. We have confidence. We have assurance because Christ was faithful. And we are asked to do one thing, recognize that surely this was the son of God and put our faith in him. May we do that today, Lord, and every day as we take up our cross. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please stand and join us in singing Because He Lives.
Well, thank you again for joining us, either in person or online. I want to remind you that we have refreshments in the lounge, and we have one next step group, that's the one I'll be facilitating, in classroom B um, at about 11.30. So following the benediction that I'm gonna read, you will be dismissed. This comes from Hebrews 13, 20 to 21. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.